dementia today. He has not forgotten where we are. We serve a faithful God and he is worthy to be praised. Amen. I'm not going to let the rocks cry out in my place. Amen. He saved me. He delivered me. He washed me in his own blood. Oh, come on. Let's give him a hand clap of praise today. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, give him a shout of praise. Praise the Lord. Oh, let there be a shout of victory in the house of the Lord today. He called us out of darkness into marvelous light. We give you praise, Lord. Turn your neighbor and tell him I'm sure glad to be in church with you today. Amen. So good to have all of our guests. Let's give all of our guests a warm welcome today. We're so glad that you are here to worship with us. Amen. We have a number of folks, a number of folks because of the season we are in. We've got a number of folks that are uh, vacationing today out of town, but we're glad all of you are here today. Amen. Thank you for being in church. What a great honor and privilege it is to have brother and sister Robinson our global representatives to the nation of Turkey. Amen. He's, he said as we were coming in, he's been commissioned by God to preach to turkeys. I said, you're in the right place today. Amen. Amen. Brother and Sister Robinson, it's so good to have them. They'll be greeting you here shortly. Uh, I will say, Sister Vondele Robinson was the daughter of Brother, of brother Hewlin Meyer, who, uh, when my grandfather uh, was elected district secretary in Louisiana and resigned the church in Shreveport, Sister Robinson's dad was elected pastor. He was very influential and very, um, uh, very much a part of my granddad, my dad's dad, really making a connection to church. And uh, he loved Brother Meyer. Of course, he loved his his, uh, he loved my granddad as well, but he loved Brother Meyer. Brother Meyer was a, a great man of God. And as a young boy, five, six, seven, eight years old, Brother Hewlin Meyer was one of the first preachers I remember hearing preach. Now that means I had to be listening. That means he was the first one in my book that kept my attention as a little boy. He was a great, great communicator. And uh, he was a great preacher of the gospel. I have great fond memories of 
Brother Meyer and his ministry in Shreveport. So it's great to have Sister Robinson with us today and the great heritage that she has. I come to the pulpit today with a word from the Lord for this church. It's found in Matthew chapter 24, verses 22 through 31. I can't tell you how deeply I've experienced God speaking to my heart about communicating to you today what he wants to say in our hearts. Matthew 24, verse 22. Now, if you know anything about Matthew 24, you recognize quickly this is the passage where the Lord is drawing his disciples aside to tell them about what is about to take place and the end of the world. Matthew 24, we'll pick it up in verse 22. And except those days be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Then, if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before, Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven. Praise God. Man, I'm praying for that day. I know we got a lot of work to do. I know we've got a lot of souls to reach. But I'm beginning to pray, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. The Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. I want to preach today from this thought, the danger of troubled times, the danger of troubled times. I want us to lift our hands and ask the Lord to have his way. Would you ask the Lord to speak to you right now? Come on, lift your voice with your hands and let's pray right now. Jesus, have your way. Speak to every heart. Lord, I ask you to do your work. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. Thank you for your spirit we are feeling. Thank you for your touch you are giving. God, I pray, Lord, just as in the worship of your people, Lord, you would be present, Lord, in this moment. Lord, we know your word's anointed, and we ask, Lord, it be received with anointed hearts, with hearts prepared with meekness to receive the engrafted word. Touch every saint of God. Touch every person that's a guest here today. Touch those that are not ready. Touch those that are in a backslidden condition. Touch those that need the Holy Ghost today. Lord, I'm praying those that are not committed, I pray today would be a day that they would commit their life to you. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And let's give the Lord a good hand clap again before you're seated. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated in the name of the Lord. So now, just like in the previous chapters of Matthew, seated like a rabbi, Jesus gathers his disciples around him privately to speak to them about the future. The future. In the middle distance, he describes to them coming judgment that would fall upon the city of Jerusalem. 
He speaks of that in this chapter. Then he cast a little further vision in the further distance to the judgment at the end of the world. It's strange that when asked about the end, Jesus would start with Jerusalem and end with the end of the age. The reason is these are connected. They shed light on one another. The warnings that are given in this chapter are not just for those that were alive at the time of the destruction of Jerusalem. The warnings are given to us who reside at the end of the age. The elements of this chapter are varied, looking as it does both at the destruction of Jerusalem and then through a telescopic lens to the end of the world. Some verses tell about the terrible days in the siege of Jerusalem. Some speak of the destruction of the temple at Jerusalem. Some of the verses in this chapter are colored by the pictures of the Old Testament's day of the Lord in that there would be sudden destruction, terror, cosmic disarray, civil war, and moral chaos. Some of the verses in Matthew 24 deal with the persecution that the followers of Jesus will have to endure. Others talk about the threats that will develop against the church, the message of the church, the purity of the church. Other of these verses speak directly to the return of Jesus Christ at the end of the age. It is a difficult chapter as prophecy always is. But perhaps the most important thing of all in this chapter it should be underlined at the outset. The primary focus is about the end of world's history. Why is that important? Because I believe I am preaching to the people upon who the ends of the world have come. The kingdom has come with the first coming of Jesus Christ. It has been inaugurated, but it has not been consummated. The disciples of Jesus Christ are citizens of two countries. We are not only citizens of this earth, we are citizens of heaven. They belong to this age, but they also belong to an age to come. They live at the intersection of ages, we could say. We are not what we were, praise God. <laughs> but equally, we are not what we shall be. <laughs> Our bodies groan for that redemption that's going to be placed upon us. That is our hope. History is moving faster and faster steadily toward that great day. I want to declare today the church is not going to be snuffed out like a candle. We're not going to be blown sky high in a nuclear holocaust. We're not going to be destroy the earth by our environmental vandalism. This world will not, however, go on forever. But I want to tell you how it's going to end. Jesus Christ is going to come back again. And he's not coming this time to suffer. He's coming this time as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Well, somebody praise him if that is your hope today. There's a link between the events of chapter of verse 2 and the events in verse 3 where Jesus talks about the end of the age. But the link is not a chronological link. It's not in chronological sequence. In verse 6, Jesus says, the end is yet to come. So when he talks about all these things, he forecasts them looking forward to the end. He said, yes, there's going to be trouble. Yes, there's going to be uh, uh, destruction, but the end is not yet. He keeps focusing them on the return of himself personally to this earth. So he's talking about his return. It is the dominant theme of the chapter, the return of Jesus Christ to this earth. I want to tell you today that brings me to a few points. And here's one, that history is going somewhere that you and I are going somewhere, that our lives are not meaningless, that life is not random, it is eternal, and we are going somewhere. 
There is a real end, just as there was a real beginning. And at the end, we shall find none other than Jesus Christ. The return of Jesus speaks of great triumph as well. The triumph of good over evil. Oh, praise God. The triumph of righteousness over unrighteousness. What a day that will be. Of God's purpose over human and satanic rebellion. Of God's reign and will in the human hearts of men and women. It's going to be a day of triumph. The return of Jesus Christ is going to be a day of restoration oh yes oh yes oh man there'll be cosmic disasters the sun and the moon and the stars the Bible says the powers of the heavens shall be shaken make no mistake about it that may not just be the physical sun moon and stars but the power that exists in this world is going to be shaken Social disasters will occur, earthquakes, famines, and wars. There'll be moral disasters, and boy, we've had enough of them. Expanding evil and darkness, the loss of love in our world. There'll be a new creation. It's going to be a day of restoration. Jesus said in place of all those disasters, there will be a new heaven and a new earth, and that will be the home of the righteous. I'm going somewhere, and it's going to be better than this. I said, I'm bound to a city, God's holy white city. Oh, yes, I am. The return of Jesus Christ not only spells restoration, it spells judgment. It will be a time of separation. I want to tell you now, everyone is welcome to walk in the doors of this church today. I don't care where you've been or what you've done or what your track record may be. You don't have to have on a certain article of clothing to walk in here. You can come in just like you are and find yourself at the foot of Jesus' cross. But I want to tell you when Jesus comes back, it's going to be a day of separation. The Bible tells us some will be taken and some will be left. Oh, you don't want to be left. You want to be right. I said, you're not going to want to be left. You're going to want to be taken. The Bible says it'll be a day of judgment because some will be separated to the left and some will be separated to the right. As a man separates his herds, he separates the sheep from the goats. It's going to be a day of separation. There's room at the cross for you today. There's a place at the altar for you today. But you better come while the coming's good because there's going to come a day when this will be separated, where the evil will be on one side and the holy will be on the other, where his children will be on one side and the children of their father, the devil, will be on the other side. It's going to be a day of separation. I want to make my calling and election sure right now. I don't want to miss my opportunity to declare whose side I'm on. Oh, give the Lord a good hand clap today. Not only will it be a day of separation, but it will be a day that is decisive. It'll be a decisive day. There'll be no more chance to repent. There'll be no more opportunity for a change. I will herald the final breaking. It will herald the final breaking of the kingdom of God. Until then, it'll be business as usual. We'll go through church services, but I want to tell you now, one of these services is going to be our last. I'm going to say it again. We don't know when it's going to be, but one of these worship services will be our last. We won't sing any more songs. We won't have any more announcements. There'll be no more bake sales. There'll be no more calendar of events. It'll all be over. It'll, it'll be a decisive moment. And the Bible says we ought to beware that it not take us as a thief. I want to be a, chill, a child of the light. I want to be aware of what time it is. So I've risen to this pulpit to tell this church today that it's getting late. And you better make sure you make your decision now. You better make sure you're dedicated now. You better make sure you're committed now. 
The return of Jesus Christ will be sudden and unexpected. In fact, Jesus tells his disciples in this passage that it'll be like lightning flashing across the sky. You don't know when it's going to blast. You have no idea the far-reaching effects. It catches you unaware. All of a sudden, there's a clap. All of a sudden, there's a brilliant light, and it appears across the sky. And Jesus says, so is lightning goes from the west to the east. So shall the coming of the Son of Man be. You'll not be expecting it, but all of a sudden, it's going to happen. And I want to tell you what's going to transpire when that light Lightning flashes across the sky. The Bible says in a moment and in the twinkling of an eye the dead in Christ shall rise and we that are alive and remain at the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them that are asleep. I want to tell you we're about to get out of this world. We're about to meet our Savior in the air. It will be an unexpected day, just as Noah's flood, 120 years preaching every day. How many thousands of messages did he preach every day? Nobody was listening, but when that door was shut, they were banging on the side of that boat, begging for one more chance. I rise to this pulpit to tell you Jesus meant what he said when he said it's going to get dangerous. The last days are going to be perilous. There's going to be trouble on every side, but the end is not yet. But he kept those disciples looking forward. He didn't leave them in hopelessness. He said, I'm coming back. I'm going to show up. I'm going to come in power and glory. I'm preaching to a young person that's gotten enamored with this world. You've chased everything on the internet you can trace, chase. You've gotten so mixed up in mysticism and crazy religions. You're diving into stuff you ought to get away from. I'm telling you now, Jesus is coming back and he's coming back after disciples. It'll come out of the blue. It's going to come without warning. The return of Jesus Christ, the time is only known by God himself. The disciples did not know. Preachers don't know. There's not one saint in this church that knows. Millennialists, post-millennialists, they don't know. It's going to come, that is sure, but nobody knows when it's going to happen. That's a fact. So today, I don't rise to this pulpit to waste my time over setting a date. I'm just going to call you just like Jesus did. Don't worry about the date. You just focus on staying ready. You just go. Oh. Come on. If all that's got your attention is trying to figure out who the Antichrist is and whether we're in the last seven years and you're trying to figure out when the rapture is, you're wasting your energy. What you ought to be energized about is I'm going to stay ready because he could come today, he could come tomorrow, he could come this week. My priorities need to be a steady endurance. It's going to get tough. Jesus said it's going to get difficult. He called me to endure, to stand, to not fold, to keep preaching, to keep holding on to the truth that's been once delivered to the saints. I'm not giving up. I'm not backing up. I'm not acquiescing to religious pressure. I'm going to keep preaching the new birth message. I'm going to keep preaching that Jesus is the mighty God in Christ. I'm going to keep preaching that you must be born again of the water and of the Spirit. I'm going to stand. Oh, somebody give the Lord a good hand clap today. So, so, My attention for this message was drawn to three verses. Verse 22, where the Lord said, unless those days be shortened, it would affect the very elect. And then he goes on to say two verses later, that deception will attack the elect. And then seven verses later, he states, but I'm going to send my angels And with the sound of a trumpet, I'm going to gather my elect. 
so it's going to get so tough that God says, I'm going to shorten the day so that the elect are for the elect's sake. I don't know if you realize it or not, but we are in a time of spiritual upheaval. I want to tell you now as your pastor, you better get all fours uh, firmly gripped on the gospel and your commitment to Jesus Christ because we are in an hour where everything that can be shaken, you better put your faith in Jesus Christ because if it is in anything else, your faith is going to be shaken. You're not going to want to come to church if you're listening to any other Messiah besides Jesus Christ. You're not going to be called to faithfulness if there's some other Lord in your life besides Jesus Christ. You better hold on to him. You better get a hold of Jesus. You better say, Lord, take this whole world, but give me Jesus. I'm talking about your job. I'm talking about your health. I'm talking about your retirement. I'm talking about your security. I'm talking about your your ease. I'm talking about all of it. You better put your trust in Jesus because we are in a shaking hour. Who are the elect? If if the days are going to be shortened for their sake, And if there's going to be a deceptive move against the elect, then I think it's important we know who they are. All right. Well, Mark chapter 13 tells us the elect are those that he chose. Luke 18, 7 says, the elect cry unto him day and night. Romans 8, 33 says, Paul says, can anyone bring any charge against God's elect? And then he goes on to say, it is God that justifies. So the elect are justified. Doesn't mean they're perfect, but they're justified. And you know what justifies, don't you? It's the blood of Jesus. Come on. Romans 11 says the elect have found what Israel sought after and could not find. Oh my. (laughs) Anybody hearing this? The elect have found what Israel sought but could never find. So it's not Israel. 1 Peter 2 and 5 says the elect are kept by the power of of God (laughs) oh (laughs) whoa I don't know but if I ain't one of them I'm kind of wanting to be now (laughs) I'm kind of hoping I are one (laughs) the more I find out who they are the more I say I want to be in that number (laughs) if they are kept by the power of God then that's where I want to be oh But that's not the end of that verse. 1 Peter 2, 5 says they are kept by the power of God, ready to be revealed in the last times. (laughs) I want to tell you one of the dangers of troubled times is that it's going to be a time of revelation. You're going to see who the people of God are and who they're not. Jesus says, or Peter says about this elect, he says they are kept by God's power and there will be a revelation of who they are in the last days. I want to tell you now, the light of the gospel and the light of the church is going to shine brighter and brighter until that perfect day. This church is not going to be snuffed out. The children of God are going to rise higher and higher and shine brighter and brighter. This world's about to get a revelation of who God's children are. That's a fact. I don't care what's going on on TV. I don't care how many people are gathered in the stadium. This world's about to get a revelation of who God's children are. And it might shock you. 
Romans 11, 7 says, Israel was God's elect, yet they did not obtain, but the election has obtained it. <laughs> Romans eleven five says, at this present time, a remnant, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Well, I think I just fell on one verse and I think it just sums it up. It's found in Revelation 17, 14. Talking about that great battle and that great war that's gonna take place. In Revelation 17, 14, these shall make war with the lamb and the lamb shall overcome them for he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And look at this. And they that are with him are called, chosen, and faithful. <laughs> I don't know where you plan to be when that's going on, but I plan to be with Jesus. I plan to be one of the called. I plan to be one of the chosen. And I plan to be faithful. No, I'm not asking you if you're called today. Many are called. Everybody in this city is called. I'm not asking you if you are chosen today. There are a few chosen <laughs> I'm asking you today, have you gone further than being called? And have you gone beyond being chosen? Are you now dedicated to being faithful? I don't care what happens, I'm standing. I don't care what winds may blow. I'm gonna hold on to my faith in Jesus Christ. I'm not gonna move. I'm not gonna sit down. I'm not gonna quit. Faithful. Somebody say faithful. faithful. Just faithful. That's all. Just faithful. There's the elect. Faithful. Faithful people are kept by the power of God. Faithful people shine brighter and brighter the darker it gets. Faithful people. Oh, but wait, that doesn't take away from the need to choose. Just because you are the elect... For Deuteronomy 30 or Deuteronomy 11:26, the Lord says, "Israel, I set before you today a blessing and a curse." Deuteronomy 30:19, 30, 3019, I call heaven and earth to record this day. I've set before you a blessing and a curse, life and death, therefore choose life. Joshua 24, 15, choose you this day whom you will serve. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden. He didn't just say come unto me all of you who were predestinated before the foundation of the earth. No, he said come unto me all that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Matthew 23, he said, oh Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered your children together but you would not. You see, the elect does not take away the the power of your choice. John 3, 16, you can quote it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever... I want to tell you the door is open for you today. If you're called, you can be faithful. If you're called, you can move into the bride of Christ. Try this on. How is this promise relative to how is this promise uh, how is this scripture uh, even true if everybody that's saved was ordained to be saved before they were ever born huh acts 2 21 and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the lord <laughs> shall be saved <laughs> That sounds like to me, whoever wants to be saved can be saved. Everybody's called to repentance. Everybody's called to the marriage supper. He's calling today. He's calling today. He's calling today. Revelation 22, 17. The spirit and the bride say, come. Let him that heareth come, and whosoever will take, uh, whosoever will let him take of the water of life freely. You can be in the elect, but it's not God putting you in it. It's your choice putting you in it. 
Oh, oh wait, what? okay. Let me put it up here so you can read it. 2 Timothy 3 and 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward. Look at that. Not willing that any should perish, but that all everybody. I don't care what color they are. I don't care what language they speak. I don't care what nation they're from. I don't care how rich or poor they are. That all men should come to repentance. I want to tell you it's for you today. You don't have to be lost. There are certain terms and concepts form the backdrop against which election must be viewed Scripture teaches clearly that God's plan includes all things according to Ephesians 1 and 11, but it also reveals that a degree and directness of God's relationship to specific events is varied. Sometimes he directly ordains things. Almost always he works through natural laws that he's already ordained and does not lift them, but in special conditions. Sometimes he decides to allow people to give full expression of their sinful natures without any restraint. Read the last portions of Romans chapter 1 and you'll wonder why God didn't intervene. If you ever wondered why God didn't change your situation because somebody took advantage of you, read the last portions of Romans chapter 1. It tells us, that God sometimes allows people to express their entire sinful nature without any restraint. There will be a judgment day. Sometimes he expects us to make choices on the basis of what is right or what we desire to do according to 1 Corinthians 10. But in 2 Peter 1 and 10, it says this, wherefore the rather brethren, here's what you ought to be doing. Don't be arguing about whether you're predestinated, saved, or whether you have a choice or not. Here's what you ought to do. Rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. I'm called today, but I'm making my election sure. I'm making the choice to serve him, to live for him. If there's an analogy that kind of falls along these lines, I guess it's the architect profession. It's helpful for us to remember. God is the architect of a plan which does include all things, but includes them in a variety of relationships. An architect's plans are detailed. So is God's plans. In the process of constructing a building, the experts can predict that so many workers could be injured or in some cases, they may even lose their lives. So they put in safety precautions. They know the statistics. So they include in the planning of the building safety measures. And yet the architect is not held responsible for injuries, assuming these safety measures have been followed. Carelessness, indifference to the rules, even violations because they don't matter are usually the causes of the accidents. But whose fault is it? It's the fault of the individual who was careless or did not follow the safety precautions. So God's plan has been designed so that the responsibility of sin lies with the individual, even though God knowingly included sin in the plan. He's called me to something higher. And according to Isaiah, Jesus Christ is the elect one. And I hurry today. If we want to talk about who's elect, let's first of all talk about Jesus Christ. He's the first elect. He's the elect one as the substitute for every sinner. It's difficult for me to limit the connection of Jesus Christ's election and to to some elected persons. In other words, Jesus Christ was elected as a savior for a select group of people. That's a stretch for me to get to. That Jesus Christ was only elected and anointed as Savior for a specific group of people. And the reason, if according to Isaiah, Jesus Christ is the elect one, then then God's will is the election and not the rejection of all mankind. (laughs) 
Jesus was the Savior of all mankind. If it's God's will that all come to repentance, then Jesus was the Savior of all mankind. It is God's will that every man everywhere lift up holy hands. That's why Jesus came. The election of Jesus is the good news for every sinner. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 6, Wherefore also it is contained in the Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. He's a perfect Savior. He was elected and anointed for our salvation. That language of election looks at things from God's perspective. It's God's elect. Somebody say amen. amen. It's God's elect. I want them to come to the music. I'm hurrying. But once there's talk, you know, what, what's so important about this message, we start talking about who the elect are and who's saved and who's not. This passage in Matthew 24 says that temptation is real. That deception is real. That there's a distinct possibility that people will be tempted and be deceived. Jesus says this must be resisted. In fact, the days must be shortened. <laughs> so if there were no possibility for the elect to be tempted, then there'd be no need for any intervention. If there were no need for the elect, if there was no opportunity for them to be shaken, then the Bible tells us there'd be no need for a warning. But they are warned. Those that are kept by the power of God, those who the angels are going to gather from the four corners of heaven with the sound of the trumpet, those elect are warned. Deception is coming. You're going to be tested. There's nothing invincible about the elect. If we stand, we stand by the blood of Jesus Christ. If we're victorious, we're victorious because of what he has done for us. But once there is talk about the elect could be deceived, then the discussion then starts turning to human responsibility. In other words, yes, I'm in the church, but I can't sit on my seat and coast into heaven. I've got to make sure my calling and my election is sure. And this is the danger of troubled times I'm talking about today. The possibility of being led astray. The possibility of being led astray. This is the danger. This is what the church is facing right now. I rise this pulpit as a shepherd, troubled over sheep who are being led astray. I don't know if you heard me. I rise today as a shepherd, calling the sheep that I'm called a pastor. Beware, you're in a dangerous time. There's a possibility that you could be deceived. In times of trouble, people tend to look for some kind of deliverer. Some kind of savior for their immediate situation. If the situation or trouble is extreme or what we would call perilous, even life-threatening, that search for deliverance may even get desperate. In fact, when you're drowning, I don't think you're worried about what color the person is throwing you the life vest. When you're desperate, <laughs> I mean, if you're laying on the concrete and they pull you out of that truck and that accident and they lay you on the concrete and some old trucker pulls over, he pulls out a wad of skull out of his mouth and flings it on the ground and looks down at you and you're not breathing, he starts compressing and then puts his mouth to your mouth and keeps you alive for five minutes till the medical team can get there. I don't think you're going to bark about that guy kissing you for five minutes. 
When you're, oh, you're not hearing me when you're desperate. No, you're not hearing me when you're desperate. And that in fact, Brother Teague, is the danger that you could get so desperate that you would reach for anything. In fact, I'm preaching to people right now that are that desperate. And you know how I know? Because you're reaching for everything. The troubles Jesus foretells are so severe that people are gonna get so desperate. Listen, I want you to notice what's gonna happen. Man, is it, I'm sorry. I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna chase the rabbit here. Is it okay? Angela and Richard, it's so good to see you back there. We love you guys. Jesus says this trouble will be so severe that people will reach such a point of desperation that they will accept false, listen, listen, false Christ. Now I want that to sit in on you. I don't want you to miss the point. The Bible says they will point him out. They will say, look, here is Jesus, or here is the Christ, or there is the Christ. That's what he said. They're going to point him out. Notice the multiple locations. They will say here and there. People will get so desperate for a Savior while in the midst of great trouble. This is the danger of troubled times that we forget what the solution is. We get so desperate, we'll settle for anything. Jesus is the answer. I love what Brother Kurt Daniels, he, they rounded him up to coach one of the quizzing teams. He said, I've never coached before. So they put him up there and he got the team together and he said, if you don't know the answer, hit the buzzer. When they call on you, just say Jesus. And when they say it's wrong, contest. And when they call you down to the judge's bench, you say, well, wait a minute. I thought Jesus was the answer. Well, that's about as easy as it gets. Jesus is the answer. Oh, come on, somebody praise Jesus. Jesus gave his disciples two guidelines. I close with them. The elect. He said, I want you to be aware, beware about two things. False messiahs, false Christ claiming to be Messiah, and false prophets claiming they are Messiah. You know what the term Christ means, right? It means anointed one. Anointed. It's a term applied to everyone anointed with holy oil. And to be anointed meant you were anointed by someone. In fact, there are many examples in the scripture of those that were anointed. You know why Jesus Christ was anointed? Not because somebody poured a bottle of oil on him. No, God anointed Jesus. But this passage says they are false anointed. Notice they are plural. There are many of them, Christs and prophets. My thoughts when reading this verse is that there will arise many who claim to be Jesus Christ. Well, you know what? I don't think a lot of people will be deceived if somebody stands up and says, I'm Jesus. I don't think one of you cats in here are going to say, oh, I believe that guy's Jesus. No. Those that know him aren't going to be fooled by that. This is not saying they're going to stand up and say, I'm Jesus. They won't fool anybody. We know better than that. 
I think the majority of the Christian world would recoil from that pretty quickly and pretty fiercely. And you say, oh, but wait a minute, they're going to have miracles. Well, there's miracles now. Oh, well. These Christ and prophets, the Bible says, will deceive many. Deception will be so complete that if it were possible, Jesus said, the very elect would be deceived. I don't think if somebody walked in and said, I'm Jesus Christ, showed up, I'm the one you've been worshiping. I don't think the elect in this room would fall for that. But this deception is going to be so subtle that unless the days of that deception are shortened, you would even believe it. Well, what does that mean? It's so subtle. Let's talk about Jesus for a minute. Why did the Jews not recognize him? You know why they didn't recognize him? Because of their messianic expectations. He did not seem to fulfill their expectations. He didn't come the way they thought he should. (laughs) And their expectations were an earthly kingdom. That would mean here and now. He's going to kick out the invaders from Rome. The oppression's going to cease. Our taxes are going to go down. And government's going to be just. And everybody's going to be okay. And there'll be a chicken in every pot. And everybody will get the vaccine. And Dr. Fauci will be this. And all our expectations. This is what a world ought to be like. But Jesus didn't show up that way, so they never saw him. But tell me about the day when somebody shows up and meets all your expectations. Tell me about how deceived you will be when some false Christ shows up and you anoint him because he comes the way you think he ought to. And he comes bringing what you think he ought to bring. And it makes you feel good. I am preaching it. In fact, some of you are in so much mental anguish right now that you've settled today for a false Messiah. You haven't poured it out to Jesus. You haven't laid your burdens at his feet. But you've gone to every person you can go to to try to figure out your dilemma. You're already worshiping a false Christ. You think your answer is in people? You think your answer is in medication. I'm not preaching against medication, but I'm telling you now, the moment we start reaching for a Messiah other than the true Messiah, I want to turn my eyes upon Jesus. You are my hope. Biden is not my hope. Trump is not my hope. The Democrats, the Republicans, Congress, the state, our governor, the the city council, the, the county board, and the list goes on and on. I put my trust in the King of Kings. Oh, somebody reach out to him right now. I feel the Holy Ghost. Don't let me be looking for a savior in the wrong place, Lord. Don't let me be looking for peace in the wrong place, Lord. Don't let me be looking for solace in the wrong place, Lord. Jesus was anointed to be savior, not tax reformer. He was not anointed to pay all my grocery bill. He was not anointed to ensure that I leave a pain-free life without any sickness. He was not anointed to ensure my overall general health or cover all my expenses. No, he was anointed to be my Savior. (laughs) This is the danger of troubled times is we'll be so fearful and agitated We're likely to look for a savior somewhere else. Oh, I'd recognize a false Christ pretty quickly, wouldn't you? Well, maybe. But are these false anointed ones so thorough because I'm the one who has anointed them? If Jesus Christ, the truly anointed one, was rejected because he did not meet people's expectations, could it be that I will accept a false Christ because he does meet my expectations? Am I in danger of anointing someone 
or something in my life just because it can make my life a little better, a little less stressful, take care of my needs, make life easier for me? Am I in danger of losing the truth just because I need a little relief? Church, it's time to stand strong. Am I placing my trust in something or someone because they're going to take care of all my medical expenses, put food on my table, pay all my bills? There'll be such miraculous things take place that you would be crazy not to anoint these messiahs. I will tell you now, the world's full of them. See, while you're reading those verses thinking somebody's going to pop up and say, Hi, I'm Jesus, you don't realize that this world is full of false saviors right now. And let me go on record. I'm not your savior. Nobody in this church is your savior. Jesus is the only savior. You're not going to be saved because you come to church, you pay your tithes, you, you fill an attendance row. You're going to be saved because you are committed to Jesus Christ and you've obeyed his gospel. So what have you anointed as a Messiah in your life, the answer to all your trouble? Are these false anointed ones so thorough because I'm the one that's anointing them? I'm trusting someone else. I've got to trust in Jesus. Church, the Lord brought me to this pulpit today and I preached way too long to ask you, what are you anointing as a Messiah in your life? Have I reached such a point of desperation in searching that I will anoint anything if it'll give me a little relief? The second thing Jesus warns is not only is the world going to be full of false Christ and false anointed ones. Notice where they'll be. They'll be in the desert. They'll be in the inner chambers. There's a variety of places you can find them. So you must not believe people, Jesus said, when they say to you, look, here is the Messiah or there is the Messiah. Looking for a savior in some remote hidden place in some little room somewhere. In fact, often in church history and today, a period of crisis leaves God's people wide open to perversion. They look for a Messiah everywhere. The danger is there may even be miraculous activity, but you know, church, miraculous activity, even in the Bible, is by no means always the work of God. The elect need to be forewarned, Jesus says, that there are many messiahs that are going to spring up. And then he says they're going to point them out in multiple locations. The idea is of secrecy, private spiritual experience. Go over here and you can find your Savior. Go over there and you can find your Savior. Don't be lured away from the wide open truth of the Word of God that is no secret thing. It was not done in a corner. The truth is ever before you. It's wide open for your perusal. You don't need a secret chamber to find your Messiah. Your Messiah is here today. Your Savior is in the wide open space for you today. The Bible says you need to buy the truth and sell it not. Don't settle for a pretender. There is only one Savior. There is only one Lord. There is only one mediator. There's only one answer to your dilemma. There's only one healer of your pain. And you're looking everywhere. But today, you've got an opportunity. Oh, make no mistake about it. These false Christs will have their own false prophets. They'll be testimonials. I took this and it made me feel like an 18-year-old. Well, maybe if you're 60, you shouldn't be feeling like an 18-year-old. I got any amens on that? 
Maybe if you're in the nursing home, you should act like you're in the nursing home. There'll be lots of testimonials. There'll be lots of people saying, oh, it worked for me. Oh, I'm not against therapy in any way. I've got a therapist in our family. I've been through more private therapy and didn't even know it. But I'll tell you this. I know people can help. People can encourage. People can help bear the burden. But there's nobody that can take the place of Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> so I rise to this pulpit today to say and declare, take this whole world, but give me Jesus. Take this whole world, but give me Jesus. That's who I need. Am I so desperate that I'll go anywhere to find the Savior? Could be. Could be that even the elect have turned from the true Messiah. (laughs) And their hope now is in everything else. And they're running everywhere to find it. That's the warning. It will be such a time of overwhelming deception that if God had not already decided to cut short the days, then nobody would survive. We're in that hour of great deception. But I got some good news for you. Isn't that great? We might as well leave the best news for last. I got some good news for you. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. And at that time shall Michael stand up. Oh my. That great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. Oh, I don't know if you heard me. Daniel said, for God's people, Michael is going to get out of his chair. I guess you don't know who Michael is, do you? You know, they were, there were three hierarchies of angels. One third of them got thrown out. The other two were there. Gabriel's the head of one, and that's the messengers. Michael's the head of the other hierarchy, and that's the warriors. And the, oh, you didn't hear me. The general is going to stand up. I want to tell you, when the general rises, somebody's about to go to war. I want to tell you, church, you got somebody fighting on your side. God is for you. Who can be against you? And at that time, Michael shall stand up. That great prince that standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered. (laughs) Woo! Man, I want to tell you, I want to be in that number. Come on, it's not over yet, but God knows how to deliver his people. Man, I I wish I could take something and be 25 again. I'd preach another hour. But because of God's grace and wisdom, (laughs) I didn't take any of that today. But let us not settle for counterfeits that meet our expectation and appeal to our security. God will not leave his people in this situation forever. For the sake of his own people, he will shorten the days. Michael will stand up and God will deliver his people. His appearance, he's about to show up as lightning in the sky. And the trials and tribulations of his people are going to be over. Hold on, church. Don't quit praying. Don't quit coming to church. Don't quit trusting Jesus. He's about to show up. Amen. 
1 Timothy 6, verse 6. But godliness with contentment, oh my, contentment, contentment. Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, let us be there with content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. I'm calling saints to fight on. I'm calling saints back to prayer. I'm calling saints back to faithfulness. I'm calling saints back to witnessing. I'm calling saints back to compassion and love one for another. There's saints of God that need your prayers. There's people of God that need your concern. Matthew 10, 22, and you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end. Anybody been checking out the, the Olympic trials? Wow, you thought I'd say Nuremberg trials or something. Olympic, the Olympic trials. The track and field, yeah. Have you noticed that if it's the 100 meters, have you noticed how they start? They blast out of the gate, off the blocks, and they run full tilt for 100 meters. They don't hold up, they don't preserve energy, no. But you know, saints, we're not in a sprint. We're in a marathon. You go to the 800 meters, and they just run lap after lap, 1,200 meters. They go to four or five commercial breaks and come back, and they're still running. No, they're not running like the sprinter. No, they started out with a certain gait, and they try to keep that a consistent pace, and they try to pace themselves. Church, you're going to need to pace yourself. You're going to need to have to say, no, I'm going to keep on running. I may not be as fast as Makai, but I'm going to keep on running. I may not be as spiritual as so-and-so, but I'm going to keep on keeping on. I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to stop. I'm going to make it to the finish line. In fact, Sister Sandy, yesterday I got a good example of this sermon. Tracy, it was the 1,200 meters, and the winner... When he was coming to the finish line, Jeannie, when he's coming to the finish line, there was a guy just in front of him that seemed to me, he came into view. Now, obviously, I'm watching it on TV, so you got to be okay with that. i got to say that for our great esteemed elders here today. I saw the, run, the, the winner coming to the finish line, Erica, and I saw somebody come into the picture, and he was running slower. And I thought, where'd he come from? I asked Cheryl, I said, Cheryl, are they about to lap the last fella? And she said, yeah. I thought, I wonder if the guy's going to keep running. Everybody else is crossing the finish line. He's got one lap to go. I thought, how odd would that be in front of thousands of people? And they just lapped you. I think I'd just go, oh, fooey, forget it. I'm done, I'm laughing. No. You know what the guy did? He kept on running. He's by himself. He just keeps on running. He just runs all the way. You know, if it was me, I'd have to hold my hands up like, yeah. No, he's kept right on going. 
went all the way around. Nobody even there. Everybody else toweling off. Everybody else gone, changed clothes. He crosses the finish line. Amen. That's what the Lord says to you. Amen. Come on. Don't quit. Don't stop. Just keep on. I know somebody might have lapped you and passed you up, but don't quit. Keep on going. Oh, come on, clap your hands under the Lord. God help you. 2 Timothy 2, 1. My Lord, you can tell I hadn't preached in three weeks, can't you? Thou therefore, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses. The same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou, Timothy, therefore endure hardness as a good soldier. Come on, Timothy. Be a soldier. No man that warreth entangle himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Hebrews 12, 1, Wherefore, seeing we are com- also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily hinder us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus. <laughs> the author and the finisher of our faith. who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Yes, these are the dangerous days of troubled times. Ephesians 6, Paul says, So now put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand. He says, Remember, you're not fighting people. You are fighting principalities, powers, Rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness. So put on your armor that you may be able to withstand. So stand with the girdle of truth around your loins. Strap on the breastplate of righteousness. Have on your feet the boots of the gospel of peace. Get a hold of the shield of faith with which you will quench the fiery darts that the wicked hurl at you. Put on the helmet of salvation and hold forth the sword of the spirit which is the word of God praying always this is how we fight our battles so soldiers I'm calling you to get your armor on it's like the sergeant running into the barracks we've all been playing cards polishing our boots learning how to make our beds but we are now in a battle and it's time for the soldiers to rise up and fight the good fight of faith. This is that hour. Would you stand right now? And I want you to get a hold of somebody beside you. I want you to pray for your friend, your husband, your wife, your, your, your peer. I want you to pray one for another right now. We're not going to do anything else but pray one for another. Lord, I'm asking you to move. I'm looking to you today, Lord. Come on. Come on, that's it, church. Intercede. Your prayers are pushing through. Your prayers are working right now. Come on. Pray for somebody. Come on, somebody's distracted in this hour. The enemy's got somebody's attention diverted. God's calling them today. the mighty God whoa 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 wait 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 I feel the Holy Ghost I want right now just right now God's moving and you would say pastor nobody you know it's so important you'd say pastor I've been looking for solutions in the wrong place I got distracted I want to keep my focus on Jesus 
I want you to move right now. I want you to step out and say, Pastor, I want to turn my eyes on Jesus again today. I want to forsake everything that's trying to distract me. Come on right now. Come on, I'm calling you. Come on, it's time to come to the altar. You got a chance right now. Come on, you got a chance right now. That's it, saints pray. Come on, there's a call for the altar right now. Pastor, I don't want to get distracted. I want to make sure I keep my eyes on the Lord. Come on, anybody else? Come on, anybody else? He's calling today. Get your eyes on Jesus. Get your eyes on the Lord. Come now, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Come on, give me some saints. Come on, give me some praying people of God that will move out of their chair and say, today's my day to seek him completely. Come on. Yes. Find you somebody to pray with right now. Come on. God's calling somebody back. God's calling somebody back. Come on. Come on, we're in a time of great shaking. Now's the time to make your calling sure. Come on, it's time to repent. It's time to say, Lord, I give myself to you.
let's pray together. Lord, thank you. I praise you today. Come on, let's praise him one more time. Lord, I exalt you. Oh, come on, tell him how important he is to you. Come on, lift him up in your own life. <laughs> yes, Jesus. Yes, Lord. Oh, come on, connect with somebody. Reach over. Come on, I want to pray for you. Come on, reach over and get a hold of somebody. Oh, in the name of Jesus, by the authority of the word and the power that's in the name of Jesus. Lord, I plead the blood of Jesus over this congregation. I pray right now for strength. I pray right now for the gift of faith. In the name of Jesus. I pray right now for a supernatural gift of faith. I pray, Lord, that our faith would not fail, that we would fight the good fight, that we would lay hold on eternal life. Touch this church. Keep them, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we submit our way to you, God. Oh, we submit our way to you, Lord. Oh, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise today. Oh, come on, give the Lord praise. Come on, give the Lord praise. Hallelujah. Come on, give the Lord praise.
as loud as you dare to yell. Now don't spit out your false teeth. But as loud as you dare to yell, you tell them, I'm going to make it. Yes, yes, yes. Come on, we might as well have a celebration today. He's coming back. I said he's coming back. Yes. Come on, Holy Ghost. Come on, Holy Ghost. Pour your spirit out in this place. Sunday I'm okay with that being my last one I wonder if you're okay with this being your last altar call you okay with it got everything you squared away I feel his spirit in this place but it's not a spirit of despair or discouragement it's a spirit of hope Oh, I know my joy is coming in the morning. I said, I know my joy is coming in the morning. Oh, let's give the Lord a shout of praise one more time before we move on. Yes, hallelujah. Yes, hallelujah. God is good. He's coming back for his people. And it won't be very long. Keep your eyes on the Lord. Somebody say amen. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and tell them you appreciate them and you love them. You're glad they're in church with you today. I'm going to let you go back to your seat for a minute. If you make your way back to your seat just for a minute. Hallelujah. If you need special prayer for healing today, you're sick in your body, I want you to come up. We're going to pray for those that are sick. Amen. If you need a touch from the Lord. Amen. We want to pray for the family of Linda Jett. This is Sister Julie Moore. Uh, Julie Moore's mother passed away this week. Uh, so we want to pray for that family, Julie and her family. Brother Mac Todd is battling a cough that he just can't, he said, I can't get a handle on it. Let's pray for Brother Mac Todd today. Amen. Let's pray for Lauren today. Anybody else, Sister Phyllis? Anybody else need special prayer? Just come on. We're going to take a minute here. This is in order. Amen. We believe the Lord is a healer. I said, I believe the Lord is a healer. Amen. I want our ministry team to come. We're going to pray for these that are sick today. Let's remember these that are on the screen behind us. Amen. Let's pray for those that have requested prayer today. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I believe you to touch the Jet family, Julie's family. In Jesus' name. Lord, I believe in you. God, give them peace. Give them comfort. God, give them strength in this hour. Lord, I pray you touch Brother Matt Todd today. Lord, we call upon your name, God. We ask you to strengthen him. Touch him today. Oh, Lord, I pray, God, you would heal his body. Strengthen him, Lord. Touch Brother Lonnie today, Lord. Strengthen him today, Lord. Touch Lori today. 
today, Jesus. Give her the healing that she needs right now, Lord, in the name of Jesus. You're her help and strength. Touch Rissa today. Touch Sister Phyllis today. Touch Brother Robbie today. Touch Sister Tim Sword today, God. I believe you, Lord. I'm trusting you, Lord. I'm trusting you, Lord. Oh, thank you, Jesus. These are great people. They've invited us all to come to Turkey. <laughs> Amen. Would you welcome Brother Robinson, Sister Robinson, as they come to share today? Amen. Just what's on their heart. Come on. Let's give them a great hand today. Thank you, Bobby. Wow. God is so good and He is so awesome in this place. My heart is full. I've just felt like crying the whole service. I feel emotional for several reasons. One, it's good to be in a church that you can advertise you're a church. I'm thankful for the light in this city. I'm proud, godly proud. Brother Calvin Jean and his wife, so nice to see them. The connection with my earthly father is great, but the connection with my heavenly father is even better. And uh, I guess I'm a little emotional too because I talked to a young man in uh, our country this morning. I want to be careful what I say because of streaming but uh, his family is basically not speaking to him anymore because they found out about his faith and uh, he was all over Turkey actually brother Gene you were all over Turkey this morning first Timothy was written while Paul was in Laodicea then second Timothy uh, Timothy was probably in Ephesus these places are in present-day Turkey and you read a lot about it in the Word of God 
I want to encourage every age today. God's word, I do have an electronic Bible in here. Don't let it go. Buy the truth and sell it not from the youngest to the oldest. His word's not going to change. And as, the, as it was on the day of Pentecost, um, though, like I said, there were a lot of apostolics in Turkey in the first century. It's not that way today. It's 99.8% Muslim. And one, that's one reason I encourage you. They're great people, lovely people, hospitable people. But I encourage you, hold on to God's word because it don't change. It's the same way as it was in the book of Acts. And I want to say thank you for your prayers for us, for people who do what we do. Go to other countries because God, I mean, he's here. And right now he's in Turkey and he's in France and Belgium, all the other countries. He is an amazing God. I could go on and on and on, but I'm just going to stop. But if you would hit E flat, the key of E flat, every praise, just so you hear a little bit of Turkish. And Brother Gene, if it's okay, these are prayer cards. Prayer is the number one importance. Of course, we need support. And Turkey konuşan var mı burada? Turkey'ye giden var mı? I know Sister Teresa's been to Turkey. Anybody else been to Turkey? Well, go, come if you get a chance. We have to say go right now because we're not there. But uh, pray for Turkey more than just at Thanksgiving and Christmas. Okay? We know you pray then for Turkey. But pray always. We need a lot of prayer. Uh, just want to sing a little bit of every praise. Okay, in Turkish, and then we'll sing in English, guys. best words in all of Pentecost. You may be seated. I uh, do want to give you a, a short report. Uh, that was a great message. We've heard from God today. No other salvation, no other name, no other doctrine. We went to, uh, we arrived in Istanbul in January 2005. Uh, no one there to meet us. We didn't, no predecessor. 
Jesus. Paul. Paul was there. <clears throat> uh, I wouldn't advise this. It was uh, cold and raining and snowing and dark, and, and uh, we felt pretty much alone. Arriving in a city of 20 million, I want to tell you, God has uh, done a great work. I think about the lady that had the issue of blood, and she uh, managed to just touch the hem of his garment. And I've often thought, what if she had gotten a hold of the hem of his garment? Anybody feel that? What if she had gotten a hold of it? <laughs> my, my. We've gotten a hold of something. We've uh, pioneered uh, about 10 churches. Uh, seven of those I'm still pastoring. Uh, harvest is great. I travel, uh, sometimes my wife's with me, but she works in Istanbul more. I travel five or 6,000 miles every month uh, to minister to these groups uh, around different parts of Turkey very busy schedule and God has been blessing <clears throat> we are on several uh, medias not personally but we we have uh, local people who take care of that for us got a phone call one day a young man up in the city of Trabzon which is as far northeast as you can go up on the Black Sea almost to the uh, <clears throat> Georgian and uh, Iranian border. He says, we've been following you on social media and we want to be baptized, myself and some friends. They flew down to Istanbul, about a thousand miles. We had a follow-up Bible study, baptized the five of them in Jesus' name. They went back to the city of Trabzon where we don't have a church. A couple of weeks later, a uh, young man, our man, he calls me and he says, Pastor, he said, I got some people who would like to meet you. You know God's busy. God's got some things going on. You might be surprised what he's doing in your household. I said, I, I, he said, I want you to come. I said, I, I've got a busy schedule here. I, I don't know how I can get up there. Let me pray about it and I'll call you back. Before I called him back, he called me. He said, Pastor, I've got at least 40 people that want to meet with you. So I said, well, I, obviously I've got to go. I did not have a translator available, so I was going to use my cell phone with a translator in another city and stumble through it. We got up there and in just a, a small room, there was 40 plus people all sitting on the floor. I'm feeling a bit overwhelmed. And this guy, about six foot five, walks in the door, sticks his hand out in perfect English, said, hello, I'm Chase. I said, well, great. We talked a little bit. I said, would you translate for me tonight? He said, I'd love to, but I've got to tell you first, I'm not a Christian. I don't believe in God. I'm an atheist. Not interested in this. I just came to escort my mama. I said, fine. We're glad. You're, you're just a godsend. Thank you. We had a two-hour Bible study. I, I gave out before they did. <clears throat> Everybody's leaving. And at the end of it all, Chase come to me and he said, you don't believe that stuff, do you? Well, I said, yes, I believe it. He said, what about the facts? I said, oh, let's talk about the facts. We begin to separate the waters between propaganda and theory and science. And pretty soon I could see a change in him. You know, our world is full of propaganda, but there's an issue underneath it all. You better know what the issues are. I said, you better know what the issues are. I went back two weeks later. We went out into the Black Sea. 
baptized 29 people in Jesus' name. And the first one was six foot five. <laughs> and God has given us a revival among the atheists in that city. We've baptized Sunnis and Shiites and Aviv and Baha'i and Baptist and Buddhist and Branhamites and Presbyterians. I need to write bigger letters. Agnostics and atheists. In our churches, we've got Turkish and Kurdish and Armenian and Iranian and Afghani and Iraqi and Filipino. And Somebody just get a hold of his garment. This thing is real. There's a spirit in here today. There is a spirit of Pentecost in this room. You've heard it said, signs and wonders and miracles were only for the first church. Have you heard it? They said speaking in tongues was only for the first church. I've got news for them. It is for the first church, and the first church is here and alive and well. We are the first church. No other gospel, no other name. Earnestly contend for the faith as it was originally given to the saints of God. Jesus healed the sick, fed the multitudes, raised the dead. Am I all right? I'm going on anyway. <laughs> then Jesus said, greater things than these are you going to do. You might ask, what's greater than feeding the hungry? What is greater than healing the sick? What can be greater than raising the dead? Oh, there is something greater. There is something greater, and I'm looking at it right now. There is no miracle greater than the miracle of salvation. There is nothing greater in all eternity than when someone finds an apostolic altar and a place to repent and their lives are changed. There's nothing greater than being baptized in the name of Jesus for the removal of your sin and speaking in other tongues. There is nothing greater. My, my. Church, there's a spirit in here of Pentecost. They were all in one place, one mind and one accord. I am so privileged to be a part of the body of Christ. In the first century, God revealed himself through his own body. But here in this last century, God is about to reveal himself again through his body. Through his body. We are his body. We are his body. Signs and wonders and miracles will follow them that believe. We are the body of Christ. And God is about to reveal himself again through his body. God bless you. Thank you for allowing us to be here. And I, it's in the last days he's going to pour his spirit out upon all flesh. Somebody said all that's not a few here and there. All flesh. Your old men shall dream dreams. But I'm still a young man because I'm still having visions. Pastor told me you're getting ready to build a new church. I hope you build it big enough because I have a vision. I have a vision of that new church being full and this room being full also. 
I have a vision of families coming to God. I have a vision of households being changed. I have a vision of cities being turned upside down. I have a vision of God pouring His Spirit out again in these last days. I have a vision of re apostolic revival. Well, God bless you. You've had enough preaching today. I just, you, you just stirred me up. You stirred me up, Pastor. A great church, great leadership, I can tell it. God bless all of you in Jesus' name. Thank you, Brother Robinson. Bless you. Amen. Isn't it good to be in church today? Okay, out in the foyer, there is a bake sale going on today. There are baked goods. Ushers, you come on, and we're going to receive our offering. We're going to pass the plate today, and then we'll pass the desserts. Okay, now, out in the foyer, Sister Jean came and told me, she said, you let them know that if they have 50 cents, it, uh, and she said, she even said, if they'll commit to pray for the quiz ministry, I want them to take a dessert. Hey, not a deal. Okay, now there is a bucket out there for donations. You'll notice a bunch of buckets because there's no sense in having one little cup for donations. When, when Jesus gets involved, there's 12 baskets left over. So we got big buckets out there for donations. So you just go ahead and let the Lord speak to you. But there's a lot of good, a good uh, baked goods out there. In fact, my grandmother that used to teach Sister Robinson piano lessons, her six of her pecan pies are out there. These are the pecan pies that she sent overseas while my granddad was in the war, war in Europe. And she'd box them up and send them to him. Those pies, well, not those pies. Hang on, my Lord, you, might, you don't want those pies, but the recipe for those pies, same pie, and uh, my granddad would tell about getting those pies, man, he's thrilled. Anyway, ushers, go ahead and receive your, our offering today, and while we're doing that, let me make a few announcements. As, uh, remember, as you leave today, the Bible quiz ministry, uh, baked goods in the foyer. Also, every young man's battle will be meeting today at 6 p.m., uh, in the youth class, also this week is kids camp, and uh, the visitation for Julie's mother is 5 to 7 on Tuesday here at Krause Funeral Home, so be mindful of that. Uh, this Friday and Saturday is a Bible quiz tournament here at the church, so be aware of that. If you have things going or you think about dropping by, need to go do this or go there, just know that this Friday and Saturday there's a quiz tournament here on this uh, coming Friday and Saturday. Everybody say praise the Lord. Remember to be here Wednesday night. Let's believe the Lord to touch us in a mighty way. Amen. A staff meeting. I want our staff to stand. All those that are going to be at the staff meeting today, some of them, they're not here. But if you're on the staff, I want you to stand, if you would. These are great people. Amen. These are great people. Now, we're doing something today. Immediately after this service, we're going to be serving them lunch, and we're going to have a short meeting. But I want the, this staff to know how much I appreciate them. Their entire family, well, sorry, immediate family, because, you know, you saw Kevin or Aaron standing over here, and his whole family would be quite a crew in there. So we're trying to keep Gary out of that. <laughs> I'm telling you, they're immediate family because they're going to be in a meeting. They don't have lunch and all that. So we're going to just serve lunch here. So it's kind of a blessing. I want to be a blessing to them because they're a blessing to all of us. Let's give our staff a great hand of appreciation. Thank you for serving us. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together as you're giving. Uh, thank you for being in church today, and we want you to be blessed. Everybody say praise the Lord. Amen. Now greet somebody in the name of the Lord. Tell somebody you're glad to see them in the house of the Lord, and I hope to see you Wednesday. God bless you in Jesus' name is our prayer.